Thank you. Dawa Ep. Guatsi Hauba Duhiname Itzakuitsa Shui Mihanu. Greetings, tribal leaders, elders, community members, and friends. And I see so many friends out there today. My friends from San Felipe, it's nice to see you. <laughs> um, from all of New Mexico, my home, my beautiful home state. Um, NCIA has been an incredible partner to the department, to Assistant Secretary Brian Newland, and the entire amazing team at Indian Affairs, and of course to me personally. Thank you. Your advocacy on behalf of communities is steadfast, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for your commitment. I'm also grateful to see many familiar faces and respected colleagues together for this gathering of indigenous wisdom and leadership. Looking out at all of you today reminds me of something we all know so well. Indian country is in good hands. My spirits are always highest when I join a group like this because I'm surrounded by folks who dedicate your careers, your passions, even your entire lives to advocating for the countless communities that depend on you to speak loudly for them. When I got to the department three years ago, I knew we had our work cut out for us, but it's always that way, right? Over the past many decades, indigenous peoples have faced a relentless uphill battle, fighting across generations to achieve the respect and acknowledgement they have deserved, but rarely been granted. We know best what our communities need. Undoing centuries of oppression and disenfranchisement could never be easy, but with the right teams, allies, and partnerships in place, we've, create, we've created tangible, undeniable change for communities across Indian country. When I first spoke to this group as Interior Secretary, I mentioned that the Biden-Harris administration was going to be different. I said that we'd uplift and empower tribal communities by placing long ignored priorities at the forefront of our work, from building meaningful climate resilience with modern 21st century infrastructure to strengthening Indian country's power in the decision making that impacts our communities, to rebuilding what assimilation policies attempted to break. I said that we'd act for Indian country. Standing here today, I'm deeply proud to share that we have done all that and more. Let's start with the investments in infrastructure. With a historic $45 billion from President Biden's Investing in America agenda, our administration has worked overtime to ensure that promises made to Indian country are promises kept. $45 billion. That's more than 15 years worth of the Bureau of Indian Affairs annual budget. That has gone directly to Indian country since the start of this administration. I think that deserves an applause. You've heard me say this before and I'll keep saying it because that is a lot of money going straight to the tribal communities who know best how to allocate these resources. The way we do business now is transforming our communities and our children's futures for the better, especially as we tackle existential challenges like the climate crisis. We're delivering bold investments that bolster our community's response and adaptation to these challenges through programs like our voluntary community-driven relocation program and tribal adaptation planning. Across the West, resources are helping tribes to act on adaptation planning that bolsters their resilience to threats like wildland fire, prepares them for extreme weather, and ensures water security. Through our new tribal electrification program, we're bringing options directly to tribes so that everyone can benefit from our clean energy future. We're making long overdue investments in critical water infrastructure for tribal communities who face the challenges that drought and extreme heat inflict on finite water sources. We're funding long overdue Indian water rights settlements to ensure that justice is served. And we're directing billions in funding to tribes to plug harmful orphaned oil and gas wells, industry relics that spew toxic gases and threaten the health of our communities. 
But these investments will be short-lived if they are not managed in a way that centers decision-making in the hands of tribes. So I want to talk about Indian country's power. What's most important to President Biden and me is that this funding, these investments in our people and our future generations withstand the test of time and codify that Indian, Indian country is in the driver's seat. That's why since day one, we made a concerted effort to make tribal consultation foundational to how our government operates. We've even had a consultation on consultations that some of you joined. So thank you for that. These early consultation efforts are paying off in myriad ways as agencies across the administration prioritize tribal input in their work. At Interior, for example, through the Secretary's Tribal Advisory Committee, the implementation of historic laws like the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act are guided by tribal leaders who bring their lived experience and the input of their people to the table. Through regular regulatory updates led by Assistant Secretary Newland, we're giving power back to tribes in reclaiming sacred objects through laws like the Native Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Through our updated regulations, we are ensuring that tribes have a critical role in helping determine if and how items that are rightfully theirs are returned from museums and other institutions. I know this law has been on the books for many decades, but we believe that these updates provide the kind of accountability that tribes have long asked for. And when you look at the national news, changes at the Field Museum in Chicago and the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, you can see that folks are paying attention, and this is not business as usual. This part of how we are challenging power structures intended to guide operations in Indian country. Another way is through the changes we're proposing to decision-making bodies like the Federal Subsistence Board. I know we have a healthy Alaska Native contingent here this week. As you all know so well, the Federal Subsistence Board manages subsistence use on federal lands and waters in Alaska. These practices have played a central role in meeting the nutritional, social, economic, spiritual, and cultural needs of Alaska Native people since time immemorial. Strengthening Indigenous representation on the FSB will put a spotlight on the subsistence needs of Alaska Native communities, preserve important traditions, and ensure the inclusion of Indigenous knowledge for future decisions. That's why our department will soon propose to add three additional public members to the board who will be nominated by federally recognized tribal governments in Alaska. <laughs> this proposal will include not just an opportunity for public comment, but also nation-to-nation -nation consultation. Because when indigenous communities are at the table, across our nation, everyone who enjoys a subsistence lifestyle has more opportunities to thrive. But wait, there's more. We know that gaining access to federal resources is not always easy, particularly for smaller tribes. Through our new Access to Capital initiative, we are working to identify for the first time tribal nations access to and need for federal funding. We're also ensuring that solutions for land management and addressing the environmental challenges of our time are guided by indigenous knowledge. Through a new departmental manual chapter, we are infusing indigenous knowledge into decision making across the department from climate policy to scientific research. That, of course, builds on the work we have undertaken to rethink what tribal co-stewardship can truly mean. Our department is committed to ensuring that tribes play a meaningful and enduring role in the management of the landscapes that they and their ancestors have cared for over millennia. This policy of co-stewardship must be an enduring legacy if we are going to use indigenous knowledge to meet the moment that the climate crisis demands. And we're putting our words into action. 
Since the start of our administration, the Department of the Interior has signed over 200 co-stewardship agreements with tribes to ensure their role in managing their ancestral homelands. From the desert valley of Avikwame National Monument to the sprawling majesty of Baj Nawabjo Ita Kukbeni, ancestral footprints of the Grand Canyon National Monument, tribes are a vital part of how these special places will be shared with the world. Our prioritization of the indigenous knowledge and co-stewardship also extends to our management of vast landscapes that desperately need our help as extreme drought, wildland fires, and other climate fuel threats jeopardize entire ways of life. With $2 billion from President Biden's Investing in America agenda, our department is using a restoration and resilience framework to restore lands and waters that hold precious cultural resources for our people from the powerful bison that supports the vital prairie grassland ecosystem to Alaska streams and rivers that fuel irreplaceable salmon runs. I'm proud that indigenous knowledge is at the core of this work and that communities who know these lands and waters best will have a role in their restoration. These changes are substantive. They're resilient to whatever the future might hold because they cement the role tribal influence plays in how our government operates. These policies are also designed to withstand the changes of political power or ideology. They're part of the legacy we build together and the progress we accomplish for Indian country. Crucial to this legacy is advancing efforts that heal our people from generations of trauma, neglect, and harm. And that's the last piece of the commitment I made to you when we first gathered in this role, to rebuild what assimilation policies attempted to break. Beyond the monetary investments, our work must ensure that indigenous peoples can get back what has been stolen. When I announced the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative, I didn't realize then that it would become a core legacy issue for our department. Our goal was noble and mighty, to unravel the intergenerational trauma that has plagued our communities since the start of this horrific era. An era that saw indigenous children, including my grandparents, torn from their families and stripped of their languages, their cultures, and their life ways. Now in our fourth year, the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative has grown. We began with the investigative report that Assistant Secretary Newland's team poured their hearts and souls into. This is the first time the federal government has truly researched the details, schools, children, funding, and the impact of these policies. Volume two of that report will be released in the coming months. This past year, we were on the road to healing, our tour across the nation to create space for survivors and descendants, to help communities heal, and to ensure that this chapter of our shared history receives the recognition it deserves. I am so grateful to those of you who hosted us on this journey. It was an honor to be with you and your communities to listen, share, and heal together. Now with new funding from the Mellon Foundation and the National Endowment for the Humanities, we've launched an oral history project to document the experiences of indigenous children who attended the federal boarding school system. The National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition has received a grant to lead this interview process, and I know we all trust that they will do so from a trauma-informed and compassionate perspective. Important to rebuilding our bonds is our all-of-government effort to revitalize and protect Native languages. Alongside the Department of Education and other partners, we are developing a 10-year national plan guided by tribal leaders and Native language teachers to revitalize our languages. This is taking place alongside ongoing efforts in partnership with tribal colleges, universities, and universities to connect the Bureau of Indian Education's K-12 language efforts with TCU language activities across the country. 
Ensuring that everyone can thrive means ensuring that everyone feels safe in their own communities and homes. Through initiatives like the Not Invisible Act Commission, the product of legislation I championed in Congress, we're identifying recommendations created by Indian Country for Indian Country. This will ensure that historic cycles of violence like missing and murdered indigenous people's crisis and human trafficking are no longer swept under the rug but addressed with the resources they demand. When I think of this work, I think of the world we are leaving to our children, the young people who take action to defend our planet. It's these young people we're acting for, not just in defending the planet we have, but ensuring our next generation of stewards have the tools, the resources, the knowledge, and the drive to carry this work forward long after we are gone. I often say that getting young people in touch with nature early and often is the key to building long-term meaningful relationships between them, their communities, and their surroundings. This mission is why we launched the Indian Youth Service Corps and why we've supercharged this effort alongside our other youth corps programs with $15 million from the Inflation Reduction Act. To date, our Indian Youth Service Corps has launched over 50 projects across our department. As we get these projects underway, I think about the enduring legacy our young people are building, a legacy that we each play a role in cementing, one that speaks to the historic efforts we are advancing together. This work has never been easy, and each of us knows that it's far from over. I'm giving it everything I've got for as long as I stand in this role. But the truth is, it's not about me, it's about you. The profound change we've accomplished simply would not be possible without everyone in this room. It's meaningful progress that will live on long after we are gone, and that enduring legacy is worth celebrating. Dawa and Naitra. Thank you all so much for welcoming me here today. Thank you for your unwavering partnership in the work now and the many years to come. I'm so honored to be alongside you today. Thank you all so much.